let's get started. Uh, my talk is about Node.js and why Node.js, because it's hot. Node.js is really burning right now. You, not a day goes by that you hear news about Node.js on Hacker News, for example. And um, it seems that both uh, the um, hipster hackers and the programmers have declared it to be the newest thing, the best thing since sliced bread or the best thing since Rails. I guess that's where many of them come from. I haven't seen a lot of those here, so maybe this is something that the OSDC can embrace these two uh, groups of programmers and uh, bring more of them in uh, next year. But uh, they think it's hot, and many pe many other people think it's hot technology. And uh, Node.js is also controversy. Some people think it's cancer. Other people think it cures cancer. Um, to me, it's somewhere in between. So um, why do I talk about it? Well, I work at Shine Technology, and we do enterprise software development. I'm a colleague of uh, Ben over there, and uh, who talked about JavaScript so eloquently earlier. And um, we work mainly for large corporations. And uh, Shine Technology has been involved in Node.js development since version 0 0.2. That's pretty early. And uh, currently, we're running several Node.js enterprise projects. And um, that weird word, enterprise, used it a few times. And uh, that can mean all kinds of things, including a starship. But I'm talking more about uh, things where you're working with a team of developers on a software project, which means you have to be more concerned about coding conventions, uh, where the project has a long life cycle, so people get into the pro uh, leave the project and come back into the project. And uh, also you have to worry about that the technology that you choose in the beginning uh, will actually survive the length of the, the, the software uh, life cycle. And, uh, those are projects where other stakeholders may be involved, operators that deploy the software, so you have to convince them using a new technology like Node.js, or testers who have to test with the, uh, with the application framework. Uh, to give you an example of what a um, enterprise application is that we are involved in, uh, City Search is a uh, online city guide for all major Australian cities. Uh, it gives you information on restaurants, bars, clubs, music going on in different uh, cities, including Canberra. So uh, if you don't know where to go tonight, maybe have a look at City Search. Uh, the website is run by Census, which is a, a subsidiary of Telstra. And um, this website used to be Enterprise Java, and uh, Census uh, decided at one point that they uh, wanted to switch to Node.js, and uh, we were helping them to do that. And currently, this runs on two clustered Node.js servers for the front end and two clustered uh, CouchDB instances for the back end for the database. And uh, it has roughly uh, 6 million uh, hits per month. So it's not a huge website, but it's not a small website either. So something that you would need a team of developers and you know would be an enterprise uh, project. Let's talk about a little bit about Node.js. You have heard already a brief introduction from uh, Ben. Node.js is JavaScript on the server. I guess I could fight with Ben whether this is uh, the case. But I would say it's JavaScript on the server. That's one part of it. And then there is this big, long-term, asynchronous, event-driven, non-blocking I.O., which is kind of scary because there's so much information in there. And uh, basically, it boils down to that uh, it has a uh, single-threaded event loop and um, that the Node.js server is executing. And all the libraries that do input-output, I.O., are all written in a way that they're asynchronous and non-blocking. And just to give you a, a review of what I.O. is, it's everything that's not running within the CPU, basically. So this you know, classically, of course, it's a file system and uh, database access, but it's also all the access uh, via sockets, like uh, incoming requests or requests to other servers. So all of this is I.O. And uh, the libraries that uh, do I.O. are um, all written in a non-blocking way in uh, Node.js. So this concept uh, is a, a replacement for the... Uh, 
currently the standard, the multi-threading application server. Multi-threading is being used in order to uh, accommodate a large number of users. And uh, I used my favorite graphics program here to do this little diagram, uh, just to give you a brief re review of what uh, multi-threading is. So on the left, we have our application server, that's the box, and then we have the vertical stripes, those are threads, and um, I guess all the way on the left, that's the internet, right? So requests are coming in from the internet, and uh, the, first pick, uh, the first thread picks up the request, goes over to the database, and while it's uh, executing uh, the I.O. with the database, nothing else happens on the thread. And that's the, the blocking part. The, the, the uh, I.O. operation blocks any operation on the thread. So uh, if you want to have multiple users, we, ha we have to have multiple threads in order to uh, keep on computing. So the second request is actually uh, uh, grabbed by the second uh, thread, who does the database access again, comes back, and the third request by the third thread. So this is the way that uh, traditional application uh, uh, server handle multiple users, or they handle concurrency. And um, this works pretty well. Um, but in the end, um, if, if we simplify this, but uh, say in, in the end you only have one CPU, so the, the reality is that the application server multiplexes all those threads uh, into one stream that is uh, executed by the CPU. And um, these application servers are pretty much built for concurrency levels of 100 or 1,000 concurrent users. So that means concurrent requests coming in. Uh, that's where they're built for. And um, once you go beyond that 1,000, then we'll see that um, some of the, uh, that there is a certain overhead in having a thread. That's number one memory. Each thread has a certain amount of memory. And um, the uh, overhead at switching threads is multiplexing. So once you reach something like 10,000 concurrent connections, uh, this model is really not that great anymore. So uh, there's another model, an alternative model, of uh, dealing with uh, concurrent connection, highly concurrent connection, and that's the event loop. That's the model used with Node.js. And um, the uh, Node.js server just has a single thread, as we see on the left side. And as requests come in, instead of blocking during the time that uh, they're doing I.O. with the database, you see there's an arrow directly going back and um, that says it's basically just uh, triggering the I.O. and coming back immediately to the main thread. So that main thread, that single thread, can pick up the next request and can continue on like that to uh, uh, do the uh, processing of the uh, requests. And uh, the uh, I.O. is actually done on an um, operating system level. So instead of you dealing with threading, uh, or the application server dealing with threading, this is on an operating system level. So you don't have to deal with it, and um, once the I.O. is finished, it will give an event back that will then trigger further uh, computation on the uh, event loop on the main thread. And uh, that's the idea behind the non-blocking I.O. And uh, so that's the model that uh, Node.js uses. and. Um, so in that regard, Node is different. And the difference is especially that uh, this model is not new. Uh, other languages, you can get the same thing for Java, and you can get the same thing for Ruby and Python, but it's not very widely used. In JavaScript world, Node.js is the de facto server. There, is, there are others, but they're not really relevant. Right now, Node.js is the biggest uh, server uh, framework that you have. And um, the interesting part is that all the libraries for server-side uh, I.O. running under Node.js are asynchronous. So uh, it kind of turns the uh, priorities a little bit, that uh, the uh, event-driven I.O. is uh, favored over any uh, synchronous I.O. with multi-threading. So in that regards, Node.js is different. But I don't just want to talk about uh, Node.js, but our experiences as enterprise developer with uh, different parts, 
dealing with Node.js, number one, Node.js itself, but also dealing with JavaScript on the server side, and also dealing with the ecosystem surrounding Node.js. So one of the things we uh, clearly were with the version 0 0.2 that came out in uh, November 2010, so roughly 12 months ago, uh, is that we were early adopters. We were aware of that. Um, but the reality is that uh, Node.js was already su surprisingly stable with the version 0 0.2. There were hardly any problems that felt that made you feel like you couldn't go into production with that. But even now, where the current version is 0 0.2, 0 0.6, the developers are saying it is not officially production ready. And that's not really related to the stability. It's related to the uh, fact that you still have fundamental API changes, which is fine if somebody says he has a 0 0.6 version, that he's still uh, trying to find the final uh, way of structuring the API. But um, that means in the enterprise you have to be aware that uh, you have to do some refactoring in order to keep up with the version until you get some stable version. And also, because it's so young, there's still significant infrastructure missing surrounding uh, Node.js. For example, we came across that uh, we couldn't do uh, SSL uh, authentication and uh, via, via uh, TLS and uh, had to write that ourselves or that you find that the uh, uh, frameworks around Node.js are not mature as mature yet. For example, uh, uh, database drivers had to change, had to be changed several times because there were problems with the uh, database driver on the load. So um, with such an early version, there is still um, a lot uh, not unfinished. So those were some of the experience we had with Node.js, uh, using a, such an early version of Node.js. But we also had um, issues with the asynchronous event at I.O. that you have to be aware of. Um, it is a highly specialized I.O. model that uh, supposedly is particularly good at uh, con high concurrency. And um, you really have to ask yourself, uh, what does high concurrency mean? Do I have a website that's high concurrency? Um, I was uh, talking earlier that um, Node.js is basically built for something like 10,000 concurrent uh, connections, concurrent requests. And uh, I did a little math. And uh, Google currently has 3 billion requests per day. And uh, if you um, calculate then the number of searches per second, you come out with 34,000. If you say, if you assume an average search will take 200 milliseconds, that's just how it feels, you come out with 7,000 concurrent requests per minute, uh, per second. Uh, 7,000 concurrent requests. So 7,000 concurrent requests would mean that Google could run their whole front end on one Node.js server, in theory, right? <laughs> so um, that's a highly con that's a situation where there's high concurrency. Most of the time, you don't have that. Especially, I mean, it all depends on your application. But a regular website, even if you're doing a lot of AJAX, uh, the chances of you uh, running into a concurrency problem are relatively slim. So. Um, Asynchronous evented I.O. is very special, and it's particularly useful for high concurrency. And there are many of the new uh, types of websites with uh, uh, um, real-time uh, communication and uh, comment uh, are destined to use something like Node.js, because that's where uh, some high concurrency can come in. Or uh, the case where you're doing streaming, where each uh, connection is being uh, kept open for a long time, you, uh, the concurrency increases quite uh, fast. So that's uh, where something like Node.js is really interesting. Um, but the asynchronous evented I.O., uh, the programming, does, it is a steep learning curve. It's not simple. And um, I saw it almost akin to rewiring, rewiring your whole brain. Because if you use the synchronous program, you now everything is turned uh, upside down in terms of the control flow. And 
the control flow now suddenly becomes the burden of the programmer. It's not anymore that the application server deals with the, the threading and multiplexing and you write everything synchronously as if you're the only one on, if there's only one user on your uh, application server, but you have to deal with the fact that there are multiple users and that you have to make each operation very fast. And uh, so it is an added burden, you know. Now, you may not believe that uh, Asynchronous programming is particularly difficult. I mean, it, uh, it just depends on how large your programs get. If you look at this, this is the Hello World example pretty much from the uh, Node.js website. And um, we see we have http.create server, and that gets a function passed. That is the code that gets executed as soon as the request comes in. So this is basically, we say, uh, as soon as I.O. starts, we want this function to be called. And then we create the server, pass the function, and say, listen on that port and that uh, IP. So that sounds not too difficult. And it isn't. You know, that shows that how easy is it to set up a, an HTTP server. That's awesome. So, um, but um, soon you're going to get into a place called uh, the callback hell, where um, here again we're creating an HTTP server passing it a callback function that it gets executed when a request comes in. But then we start getting some data from, let's say, database. And again, we're doing a callback function. And if we then have to pick up some more data, we have another callback function and another callback function. So we have nested callback functions, one function in the next. And that's where it gets a bit messy. And uh, the fact that um, this messiness um, is not just imagined by me, uh, you can see in that there is a lot of uh, helper classes that people have written to uh, make it easier to structure your code in that in that sense. But um, so what I want to get at is that asynchronous programming is not that simple. One of the interesting parts that uh, everybody wanted to know, of course, is uh, once it came out, how does it perform? How does it perform against other uh, scripted language, other server languages? And there have been a number of uh, blog articles about uh, performance comparison. For example, on the top left, you see PHP versus Node.js. And Node.js is about double the requests per second. And uh, here on the bottom, you see a comparison of Node, the red line, Express, which is a, a web framework for um, for Node.js and Sinatra, which is a web framework for Ruby. And as the, because the blue line is on top, means it's slower. So you get a lot of these, or here, comparison of uh, Python against uh, Node.js. But um, these numbers, you know, this is what they use as proof that Node.js is blazing fast. But the reality is, you know, you have to take them really with a grain of salt. Number one, most of these tests do a simple hello world, do an Apache benchmark against it, and um, that's not really where your, your performance, uh, that's not really where your performance problems uh, arise. Most of the time you have much more problems or, or much more performance issues with the database. If you do 6,000 requests per second for a hello world without any I.O., um, and you just fetch one document from the database, even a small one, you come down to about 500 requests per second. So there's a lot more uh, performance uh, difference in, oh. there we go, in, uh, in the whole application. So this, these types of performance measurements are really don't tell you much. You can see, you know, there may be 50 or 100 percent difference in terms of the numbers, but these are people who want to prove that Node.js is fast, so, you know, you can't really rely on them. But they, they don't blow anybody else out of the water. It's about, you know, there's nobody, Node is not 10 times faster than, than Python or something like that. And uh, the reality is even, you know, PHP, um, the, um, the lack of performance for PHP didn't hinder PHP to become a very uh, prolific language. So uh, I would take these performance measurements with a grain of salt and people who say, oh, no, just blazing fast.
So the other thing that we had to deal with when uh, using Node.js is, of course, JavaScript on the uh, server side. Mm. One of the good things about JavaScript is that it's the most common programming language in the world. And, um, you know, especially if you're thinking enterprise, long life cycle of the software, you'll find JavaScript developers in five years on as well. So that won't be a problem. And actually, as Ben was uh, explaining, JavaScript will only increase in popularity. The whole single page uh, websites that we have nowadays and, uh, you know, putting the fat client in JavaScript all on the browser will only mean that JavaScript is here to stay. So um, in that sense, the choice of JavaScript for server language is not too bad. And on top of that is a dynamic interpreted language, which means you have a quick development turnaround in comparison to what I'm used to, Java, enterprise Java. Now what we found um, particular good on uh, using JavaScript is something that uh, my colleague Cliff over there uh, used as a presentation title which he called JavaScript from nose to tail uh, which describes pretty much the city search project where uh, they decided to use um, CouchDB as the database backend which is a uh, JSON based document database uh, with JavaScript views and um, already had a jQuery front end to display their data. And so the uh, choice of using Node.js as a JavaScript uh, platform was very natural and uh, was very helpful. Uh, suddenly you had a single development language. There was no uh, break between the front end developer and the back end developer. You could uh, use this, you could reuse uh, uh, validation and uh, models that uh, you use in the front end. So uh, in that sense, JavaScript is quite uh, quite a good choice. And um, you have no translation between the layers because you have JavaScript everywhere. And one of the things that I particularly liked is that a JavaScript object is a JSON object is a JavaScript object. So there's no distinction. There's no translation, no marshalling, unmarshalling that needs to be uh, done in order to use a, uh, or manipulate a JSON object within JavaScript. So as JSON becomes more and more the language of exchange uh, of, of data between uh, different points, uh, using JavaScript as the language to uh, manipulate it is, uh, comes very natural. But actually, JavaScript is not all joy. Uh, it is an interpreted language, and that means that all errors occur at runtime. And uh, that means you have to, if you're, uh, if you're making changes to your software, you need to make sure that every code has been run at one point in order to ensure that even stupid mistakes that usually get caught by a, a compiler, like passing, passing the wrong object to a method, um, gets tested. And that's why you have to do test, test, test. And um, to give you an idea of how much testing you have to do, um, we were looking at something like 60% test code for 40% application code. So you're going to be spending a lot more time doing testing than actually writing the application. And um, that's necessarily in order to make sure that your software runs properly. And, you know, this is okay if the project is small, but this problem, this testing issue becomes... Uh, more apparent as your project grows. And uh, we had, in many cases, we had the situation that we would uh, adjust our code and the test would break, even though the code was OK. So um, it's very hard, you know, writing proper tests that uh, are not brittle uh, is an art. And um, we're not really there yet that we have that much uh, information of how to write proper testing. So we had a lot of problems with the testing, especially since there was so much code. Uh, the dynamic typing um, is good when you, uh, you know, it helps in flexibility, but uh, it does make refactoring difficult because uh, you don't have the IDE support that you have with uh, static typing. And um, in enterprise projects, if you're using, if you're working with different people together, uh, different programming styles, uh, you need refactoring. You need to bring them together. Or, for example, imagine you ch exchange the uh, Node.js library, you say, okay, I go from 0 0.2 to 0 0.6, uh, 
there's no IDE who tells you where the code has changed. So this becomes much more uh, a problem uh, as you um, use this on a server. Another thing that we found uh, that even though there, uh, there are programming conventions in JavaScript, these programming conventions are not widely used and they're not as stringent as you have in other languages. And this is partially because JavaScript, in my opinion, it's partially because JavaScript comes from the front end. And if you're developing your own code, then adhering to some standard is not really that necessary as long as you can work with your code or if you agree on your standard, uh, you'll be fine. But once you do uh, team development in the server side, this becomes much more of a problem. So, um, you know, in that case, I guess you could consider that node causes cancer, it causes eye cancer, because you always have to look at other people's code and think, ah, what did they do? You know, in terms of the variable naming or logging standards or file naming standards, that's all uh, not really widely used. So another thing that um, JavaScript has a problem with is that it really doesn't have any provisions of programming in the large. And what I mean with that is um, that you don't have a module system built into JavaScript and uh, you don't have a class system we were talking about earlier. You know, you can you know, argue whether you really need that. But um, there are a lot of provisions that uh, JavaScript doesn't have. Node.js has said, OK, we need module system. We need public methods in the server side in order to have a projects of a certain scale. So they set, uh, they used a library called CommonJS in order to provide that. And uh, that's a good, uh, that's very necessary in order to import modules. But uh, it shows that JavaScript doesn't have those provisions right out of the box. And you're trying to build up a language that is not really meant for that. Uh, for uh, server-side programming, build it up to be something bigger. So those were our experience and my experience with JavaScript. In terms of the community, the community is really open, welcoming, and helpful. And uh, the mailing list is very active. And uh, you could even get uh, the inventor of uh, Node.js, Ryan Dahl, to answer some of your questions. And uh, so that's really a good thing. Uh, we didn't have problems with that. We had uh, issues with uh, one of the database drivers, Cradle. And um, I put in a, uh, a bug uh, report, and it was immediately fixed. And uh, so in that sense, it was really great. Um, we have also around Node.js, we have a really exploding ecosystem. There's libraries are being built. People are inspired by Node.js. And libraries are being built everywhere in frameworks. Now. Um, not everybody who wants to build a library is really capable of building a library. That's what you find, that a lot of people developing in the Node.js world come from other la languages like uh, Ruby or Python, and they see the need or would like to uh, port their favorite framework to the Node.js ecosystem. And uh, as such, um, not everybody is really up to that uh, challenge. In the, worst part about it, and this is a bit a criticism of the whole social coding, is that if you put a framework out there, chances are people are going to use it. So you have a responsibility, these people, towards these people, that um, you have to uh, you know, answer uh, bug reports and, and keep on developing on it. And uh, it's not enough just to put it out there. So um, one of the interesting... Uh, Quotes that I heard is uh, T.J. Holowaychuk, who wrote one of the main Node.js frameworks named Express. It's a web framework. Uh, if I only had a dime for every Ruby library poorly ported to Node. So uh, he's seen a lot of those. And um, so you have to deal with that. And there's also the situation that uh, there are only very few libraries that have really uh, dominated in the Node world. Express is one of them. But in terms of the other ones, uh, everybody, uh, libraries are being uh, built by two, three, four different people who are all kind of fighting for dominance, I guess. And um, so it's very difficult at this moment to pick the right library. This is something that might not be, uh, uh, there's, there's no continuous development in three months' time. 
And uh, in an enterprise project, that is a problem. So when to choose Node.js then? Well, one of the things we saw is that it's good for high concurrency, but high concurrency is not as simple as just picking the right uh, framework. That's the base. And uh, if you want to do high concurrency, then you have to deal with uh, other things that are much more important, so uh, like, like optimizing your database access. Uh, the thing that we found that it's very good about, uh, for is the JavaScript from head to tail. So if you're working uh, towards using a uh, no SQL database like CouchDB or MongoDB, then JavaScript is a very good fit. And of course, you have the quick development turnaround, so you can set up um, a server very quickly, and um, that's really a plus. But when you're developing for uh, Node.js, you have to keep in mind asynchronous programming is a burden after all. It's not, it doesn't come for free, and it's not just um, something that you, you can quickly pick up. And um, because there are no conventions uh, being really followed, you have to define for your team, you have to define your programming conventions early so you don't have to worry about, you know, it doesn't look very pretty, but I can't refactor because I'm in a dynamic language. And then, as long as we're not at a 1.0 version of the uh, of uh, Node.js, you have to stay in sync with the library. And um, just because all your libraries that depend on Node.js will keep on uh, uh, that, that if Node.js uh, increases in the, in the version number, then the libraries will also only uh, work with the newest version number. So you have to keep on um, keep up with the Node.js version. We had the situation that we had a, um, the version 4.9 of Node.js, and uh, we had a problem with the database driver, and um, we reported it, and as I said, they were very uh, courteous to help, but um, they said, well, this is fixed in version, you know, the one that runs with 0.5.0 with Node.js, and um, this may cause a special problem if you have other stakeholders. You know, if you have to convince other people to say, okay, in production, now we need the newest Node.js server as well. You have to keep that in mind that uh, there's some convincing to do. So um, at this stage, if you're capable of staying in sync with Node.js versions, then it's fine, but otherwise it's better to wait for the 1.0 version. And that wraps up my talk. I already put some questions up there. But uh, go ahead. Uh, it's going to be coming. Okay. Because, um, yeah, you, as you said, anyone put libraries up. And there's a couple of good libraries that lots of people use and probably don't even realize that they've got sync in them. Absolutely. I, I wasn't aware of it. The thing is that um, I just recently, there was for some obscure database, somebody wrote a database driver and he said, oh, yeah, this, this is the synchronous version of. No, no, no. And I was like, yeah, yeah exactly. But then it's a wrong library for Node.js. Yeah. But I didn't know that. Uh, I guess uh, well, you have to yeah, hide in the... Yeah, because if you're trying to do a directory read and then you want to read all the files and you want to do a stat in every file, that requires, well, there's lots of them, that's fine. Yeah. It's making it not asynchronous, but um, lots of the libraries don't do that. And then it's fine when you're doing it in a local part of like the spread library does, but only to read the mind types. So yeah, exactly. At startup, start exactly. I think you're doing it when you want to read a brick. Uh-huh. That's interesting, yeah. Thank you. Yes, please. <coughs> you're talking about Yes. Do you think we're going to see uh, a, a framework or a, a, a tool in node.js of making those kinds of things a little easier? So uh, yeah. Mix yes. Mm -hmm. A feature that kind of synchronous get these things and put them in here. I mean, the example that I showed was something that synchronous code excels in doing one thing after another, and asynchronous code is not really good, or asynchronous program is not really good at. And many people have realized that, so there's many little, not frameworks, 
you know, snippets uh, that try to solve that problem for you. And again, you know, one of the problems is that everybody tries to solve this problem for you. And so you have a lot of frameworks or a lot of uh, libraries out there. But on the other hand, um, there, it is possible. And I think Node.js originally uh, used a different version that doesn't use the callback methods in order to make it simpler. But now they said, well, we use, uh, I guess, callback methods is more uh, is the more basic way of eventing. And so other people can build upon that libraries that make it simpler to use. Yeah, exactly. And the nice thing is when you then get to someone who says, okay, we're going to merge all of the good things into one framework, and that's the one they would use. And so then everyone just goes, yeah, awesome, we're using it. That'd be nice to see. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. And it's. it's no, I was just going to comment yeah. that I actually had a whole lot of tasks to do which were sort of more synchronous tasks. I just put them in a separate link and just wrote curl and then just did a. Ah. Yeah, if I had a connection in there, I wanted to build thumbnails or other things rather than trying to rebuild the applications that already used it in Node.js. Yeah, that's true. So it's just a non blocking request for that whole thing. And there could be a queue too, so you didn't have to like, you know, load up a system which had lots of them. I'm sure people might be waiting for those processes. It has no load on extra uh, known for them. Okay. Any other questions? We've still got a lot of time. See, 17 minutes. Go ahead. Sorry? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, because Census originally uh, does enterprise Java, it was very hard uh, to uh, convince these operators to uh, deploy Node.js. And so they wanted to stick with their Apache server as a front end, which is uh, kind of defeats the purpose of this uh, um, uh, asynchronous I/O, and uh, the you know because it's a multi-threaded uh, server. But the websites don't have that high of a load that this really would make any difference. But they they trust Apache for I guess uh, security routing and stuff like that. So they wanted to keep the Apache. That's a good question. Uh, we were completely divided in our team. Right? Uh, one guy used Emacs. He thought he was a programmer god. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'm, I'm close to actually giving Emacs another try. But one was using Emacs. One was using, I think, uh, what was it called? This uh, JavaScript IDE. Uh, Komodo. Komodo. Yeah. Yeah, Aptana, something like that. And uh, I was using Eclipse because I'm just an old uh, enterprise Java developer. It didn't really help me with anything. Um, but uh, that is a real problem. I mean, Aptana is trying to uh, create a JavaScript. And I think Cloud9 is a, a cloud-based IDE. Uh, it's trying to help you with uh, the coding. But um, the, the issue of refactoring is still not really solved. And uh, so they're only partially helped. And um, JavaScript Sorry? JavaScript okay. They actually have a Yeah, exactly. In that original image, there looked to be uh, a fair mixture of static components and dynamic components in it. And in a traditional setup, reverse proxification would play a pretty big role in the static components. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. well, what happens when you go to code.js and says we're doing the reverse proxification stuff? Uh, I'm not 100% sure. You're talking about static content? Yeah, I mean, for us, it was served by the Apache server. So the static content just came so by the Apache. Everything you're talking about here was just for the <coughs> components already pre existing as 
that's, that's JavaScript, you know, that's, that's dynamic and generated on the server. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think, uh, I think uh, Node has a, like a public directory, so you put all your public assets, all your static assets in that directory, okay. mm -hmm. and then it's mainly for the dynamic stuff. Ah, yeah. No, you wouldn't tell the difference. I mean, in theory, it could be, uh, it should be faster, but uh, in practice, as I said, you know, that depends on a whole bunch of other comp components. But no, you wouldn't be able to tell from a user perspective. Yes. And, and, and very high performance compared to the other platforms. Yeah. 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 Yeah.